Wait, right here. And, uh, yeah, I'll edit this out. Okay, go, Jason. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, welcome to Popnosis, which is a segment on Talknosis. It's where we engage with pop culture media uh, by looking at it with a Gnostic lens. And uh, when we put on these mastic, mastic, these magic Gnostic glasses, we're not asking, is it meant to be Gnostic? What we're asking, I think, is a more interesting question. Can we make it Gnostic? So we're going to bring in all of the scholarship, all of the theory, all of the history that are at our fingertips. But this is, I think, where the Gnosis meets the road. Can you find it in the world that's around us today and the kind of things you can you can watch on, uh, for example, in this episode, a show on Amazon Prime called The Green Knight. Uh, I think you can find it there, and I, we're, we're going to talk about it today. Um, John, do you want to maybe give a quick, uh, or actually, before I dive in here, so yeah, I'm Jason Memel. I'm part of the uh, the Talknosis group. Uh, maybe I should also introduce our co-host for this series, B. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm B. Skolnick. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a writer and witch and uh, podcaster, much, much more, <laughs> hanging out on unceded and occupied Lenape land, also known as New York City. And uh, you might have seen me on another Talknosis show at some point, but I'm very excited to be back. And yes, I think we've picked a great one for the first official Popnosis Uh trying to find it in the modern day through a 14th century Arthurian legend, I think. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> we've done it. <laughs> uh, John, do you want to kind of like give a, a Green Knight uh, summary? Yeah, I'll try to without without too many uh, spoilers. Uh, like B, I watched it this morning, so it's uh, it's fresh <laughs> in my mind. However, you know, I did say I You're wanted to do to the. Supposed to tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, but I also did so, um, and uh, even though I, I kind of wanted to do the synopsis, uh, as regular viewers of Talk Gnosis know, I have a bad brain, so I'm going to try to do it without too many spoilers. But something else that we I always like to talk about what we're talking about behind the curtain, which is very gnostic, right? It's Wizard of Oz. So peeking behind the curtain like really you know pause right now go to amazon prime or BitTorrent, and <laughs> <laughs> i mean what, what's worse I, I want creators to get paid i don't necessarily want to send them to amazon even though i use it every day and uh, it's uh, also I on showtime that's what thank you if you're showtime. in the states yeah there we go there we go i think amazon prime has a free trial so anyways watch the green night i quite loved it uh i i really thought it was an excellent movie uh, I really wish somebody had told me about it before. That is an in joke. Uh, a good friend of Jason and I, uh, the head, the head of the Gnostic Church that we're in, has been, I think, literally telling me every couple days uh, for the last year and a half since I came out to watch it. Uh, he's also, uh, uh, well, he's also a, a practitioner of Celtic spirituality. He's uh, he's an Obad and uh, is both a a, uh, a Christian patriarch and a, uh, a druid. So uh, he's, he's a very excellent person to to uh, to talk about this movie. But he's not here. We are. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're even better at this. No, he's really good at this too. But he's been telling me to watch the movie a lot, and I, I wish I had listened to him. Uh, I will start off with, with why I'm on this show because I'm not going to be a regular a regular host or cast member. But I um I have uh, an unhealthy obsession with Christmas. You know, maybe hopefully I can work this out in psychoanalysis and be healed. But uh, I, I, the Green Knight is is a very a very Christmas uh, uh, story, and I think this is a very Christmas movie. Um, and that's because Christmas is weird AF. Um, and there's a secret, a secret that we can't go into right now. But Christmas and Halloween are the same, same thing. They're the same season. There's one long season that stretches from October 31st to February 2nd. And, and of course, be with, with part of your witchy background. Maybe your witchy uh, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the sixth and seventh and eighth senses are going off because I think this also kind of lies They're up tingling. with some of the yes. yes. Yeah, but I'd also make an argument that it's, you know, it's one of the things that kind of bring together uh, paganism and Christianity, because I think it is in the Christian traditions, even if they, they quote unquote, baptized it and, and brought it in from, from pagans. Uh, anyways, a little rant before I get into the synopsis, which is, I really found that this movie captured Celtic spirituality, Celtic religion, Celtic paganism quite well, maybe in ways that, that when I'm reading about what the director meant to do, that, that he didn't even realize, that are perhaps coming out archetypically, but he obviously did a lot of research and read a lot about the, this story but it, but it is a story of ancient roots but as B said it goes back to the 14th century uh it was probably written by a monk and there's a theory i cannot remember the name of the author 
uh, uh, who wrote this paper, but it's a scholarly published paper in a journal that says one of the points of the Green Knight was to bring together Christianity, paganism, and magic in, in a unity to say that these three, these three things can work together. They don't have to be opposed to each other, which in my mind is, is very Celtic. It's, it's sort of a lot of the Celts uh, peacefully converted to Christianity, and they didn't see, you know, some of them were forcibly converted, but many peacefully converted. And, and a lot of them, I, I, I don't think, saw Christianity as, as a new religion. Religion, right? They're just like, oh, we've been doing stuff like this already. Um, and they're just putting a spin on, on their relationship to, to the land and the spirits of the land, and maybe sometimes turning them into saints. Rant, 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 rant. Maybe you've read The Green Knight in high school. I had to. Um, but this is this is a really excellent rendition. So there is a, a knight named Gowan. He is, uh, unlike the 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 narrative poem that this is based on in, in the original poem he's he's a, a fantastic almost perfect superhuman knight who uh who is made better but in this story he's uh, a bit of uh, uh jason are you gonna edit this uh like i don't know who's uh it's jason show so uh he can hit the bleep button he's a bit of a fuck up uh in this particular movie right so he's he, he's a wastrel you know he drinks too much um he, he doesn't treat his his lady friend who's of low class and it is a sex worker very well you know he wants to be a knight but he's he, he's a bit of a screw up um and uh, he's in Arthur's court. He's actually Arthur's nephew. Arthur doesn't have a son, so he is a successor to Arthur. Something very cool that the movie does, they don't spell it out. I don't know if they ever say her name. But his mother is, is Arthur's sister, uh, Morgan Le Fay, who in, in the Arthurian legends is, is often a villainous, but it's actually... Because there's so many, you can't say the Arthurian legend. There's Arthurian legends, and you know, uh, in some of them, she's a very ambivalent figure. Actually, in some of them, she's a positive figure. And I, and in this movie, she's she's kind of an ambivalent figure, mostly a positive one. Um, so he he wants to be a knight. He does want to be better. And uh, on on Christmas Day, uh, the court of King Arthur assembles, and Arthur has this tradition where he wants to play games and see something amazing happen. And uh, when when he announces this, uh, it, it actually intercuts to his mother, the witch, uh, seemingly doing some kind of spell. And it, you know, the movie can be quite subtle. It doesn't spell everything out for you, excuse the pun. But as this happens, a, a, a green knight uh, enters on a horse holding holly and ivy. And when we say he's a green knight, he's literally made out of wood. He's a tree. And he says, anybody who uh, uh, strike me and uh, one year from now on Christmas Day, 365 days uh, uh, from now, if you're brave enough, I will return that strike uh, with my very own axe. So um, he gives the, uh, uh, you know, the, the knights are, you know, what's going on? Who's going to do this? Gowan wants to prove himself. He grabs the, uh, the axe uh, and uh, the green knight just, you know, kind of goes down and submits. And Gowan is kind of a little freaked out by this. So what kind of, what kind of blow is he going to give this guy? But he doesn't want to be seen as a coward. So he gives him the, the full Monty, cuts off his head. Um, and is actually kind of kind of shocked at what he's done. Uh, maybe even ashamed. You can kind of see it in his eyes. By the way, I think this movie is 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 uh, very well acted. Also, uh, I like lots of diversions. I haven't been to watch this movie a lot. I, I, I again, I'm very uh, considered it a Christmas movie, and I neurotically can't watch Christmas movies outside of the Christmas season. So it came out last summer, the last year, and then I had to wait to Advent. But then we were really busy, and I think unconsciously I didn't want to watch the movie of my wife because there's a lot of Dev Patel with his shirt off. And <laughs> that's that's intimidating to me and my manhood. He's a very, very he's a very nice looking man. But this, this diversion is coming in that he's he, that he's an excellent, excellent actor. Um, but what happens is is that the, the Green Knight picks up his head, tells him basically, "I'll see you in a year's time." You know, goes out right. So uh, uh, so obviously, if the blow is to be returned, that means that uh, the Gowan is going to lose his head. So he's pretty freaked out about this. Uh, some other things happen. He goes to visit his, his lady love who wants to be his lady, but, you know, she knows that uh, he, he's not embracing her love because she's lower class. Uh, what else? That was uh, a pretty brutal shot, too. Oh, like, they just oh. stayed on her, and she just realized it wasn't going to happen. I was like, oh, girl, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's why, you know, it's not always a subtle movie. My description of it so far doesn't make it sound very subtle. But I think there is a problem. Like, I find we live in a very literal age. So so I think a lesser filmmaker would have, would have you know, spelled that out a little bit more with some more dialogue. But it's, you know, it's it's well acted. And it's, you know, it, it really, there's, there's so much that lingers and sticks in your head. Um Yada yada yada. Oh, there's a great. There's a the great... person who watched it this morning. There's so much <laughs> that really sticks with you <laughs> for a whole afternoon. 
um you know there's this great uh man i'm getting all over the place with diversions which we will talk about the themes but there's this there's this great there's this great you know line before he goes to cut off the 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 green knight's head where, where arthur says you know don't forget it's only a game right which which i think is very very important to to the movie mm -hmm. so anyways he's all freaked out but um uh basically you know a year passes of him being freaked out but he 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 doesn't want to be embarrassed. He wants to be a knight. He wants to be brave. He wants to be honorable. So he's supposed to go find a green chapel where he's going to uh, meet the green knight. Now, I can't do the whole plot of the movie, right? So he uh, he runs into uh, uh, the cinema's new greatest creep, uh, Barry Keehan, I think is how, what his name is, who's... Uh, he's the new Joker. Uh, he's he's excellent at, at being uh, creepy and unsettling. Uh, he steals his horse and and the Green Knight's axe that uh, that was left behind. Um, kind of betrays him. Uh, there's a magical fox, which is really cool. That seems to be associated with uh, with Gowan's mother. There's an encounter with uh, a very Celtic encounter with with a saint. That's a really great fusion of 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 pagan and and Christianity. Um, Celtic mythology has they're very obsessed with with wells and heads and he heads going off people into wells which also feeds into this head stuff um eventually he ends up at a at a mysterious castle with uh with a with a mysterious lord and and his lady and a really creepy old lady with uh, um uh, uh with a, a white sash over his eyes more things happen right but if i said the whole movie would be here for the duration of the movie um and the uh, uh, the sexy lady, I, I don't think, are they ever given names, the Lord and the Lady? Uh, the sexy lady is played by um, by uh, uh, Lisa Cucumber, a uh, very excellent uh, uh, actress. Um, if, it, if you haven't seen her of Vep yet, everybody should watch her of Vep. It's not Gnostic, but it, it's very good. Um, she's... Alicia Vikander. It's okay, it's okay. Is that how you say it? Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so uh... <laughs> And At she's least the and she's the lover too. Yeah, she she's plays the lover both. too. She plays both. She yeah. Plays both. yeah, yeah, and she's she's excellent at both. And she's she's an amazing actress. And um, uh, she uh, she she's I, I'm bringing up her Vep as well because uh, she uh, she loves playing femdoms apparently. But we'll we'll get to that. Um, so uh, so anyways, uh, blah blah blah. She's very sexy and alluring. And the the Lord says, you know, let, let's make a deal. He he gets he gets in. Man, I'm not good at this. So Gowan gets in. I'm honestly September. enjoying the synopsis a little more than I enjoyed the movie. If I'm oh, being good, honest. Good. Oh, yeah. Okay, 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 excellent, yeah. excellent. Well, in that <laughs> case, I'll, really. I'll go back and I do the whole. <laughs> I'll go back and do the whole thing. So, <laughs> okay, so um, he, uh, uh, he he arrives on December 21st, the winter solstice, of course, and the Lord says, hey, actually, I know where this green chapel is. Um, you know, he's had all these adventures where, he, where he's beat the shit. Um, uh, the, I'm making lots of work for Jason if you can beat that. And uh, <laughs> so he's like, yeah, look, I'm going to go out hunting. You can stay here all day. You can freshen up. You know the the green chapel is really close. We'll we'll get you over there, um, and uh, let's let's play another game, another little game. Uh, everything everything I get when I'm out hunting, I'll give to you. Everything you get during the day, you give to me. So uh, so um, uh, Alyssa vacuum cleaner, she she's very seductive, and um, she you know first first she gives him a kiss, right? So you know he he gives the Lord a kiss, but the the next day, and, and by the way, this is in the original. Um, like I don't always like when subtext is made text, and, and I, again, I think this movie does does a good job of it because it, it's hard. Like you know, if you're reading the original, the, the original, the, 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 there's some cool gay stuff in there that is subtext, and they kind of keep it a little subtext. But um, she she comes to him and says, uh, "Hey, I'm, I'm going to give you this this magic belt, um, and uh, if you wear it, you'll be protected from from any uh, uh, from any harm." And then she kind of femdoms him and jerks him off. And look, the movie's much better than I describe. So what what he's what he's supposed to give to the Lord, uh, who's who's uh, I should just call him Ian Curtis, the theater who played Ian Curtis in uh, the twenty four hour uh, party people in like two thousand and one. So everybody at home, no, this movie doesn't have Dev Patel jerking off Ian Curtis, but that would be an excellent movie. So what he what he's supposed to do oh is. Cool. Is give is give this this magic belt and I guess a hand job to the uh, to the Lord, but instead what he basically does is is, is run away. So um, he runs away and I, I think he's intending to run away. Period. But instead he goes back to the Green Chapel. His magic fox is there, telling him he doesn't have to do this. Eventually he goes to the Green Chapel. 
um, the, uh, uh, the the Green Knight is there, kind of like hibernating, and he gets down on all fours and kind of waits. There's actually a kind of cool scene where the Green Knight's uh, face kind of changes into actually all the characters from the movie, which um, is, uh, uh, I think, some of the game aspect. And, you know, the Green Knight comes to life, and he's like, are you ready? And then, he, then he's like, yeah, I'm ready, but then he flinches. And then the Green Knight says, are you ready? Then he flinches again. Then the Green Knight says, are you ready? And he then he runs away. Uh, then he runs away, and then he, he goes back, and he uh, um, he, he has a child with his, his low-class lover, but he does the wrong thing, and uh, uh, the baby's taken away from her, and he marries a high-class woman, and then he, he basically betrays all of his morals. He doesn't become a great knight or king. He doesn't hair Camelot, but of course Camelot falls. Everybody hates him. There's like, you know, scenes where they're throwing uh, throwing rotten vegetables at him. Eventually his family abandons him, abandons him and he's left alone on the throne. Um, and he, uh, realizing his big mistakes, he, he finally takes off the green belt he's been wearing this whole time, right? Which he was supposed to remove. And as he does, his head falls off and then we cut to back to the Green Chapel. It was all a dream or was it? And he says, now I'm ready. You know, the, uh, the Green Knight takes up his axe and then it cuts to black. The, the director did say that he, he did actually film an ending where he, it is left ambiguous, but I, I think you are, in the original story, he does survive. He actually gets a, a, a cut on his neck because it turns out that the Green Knight is is the lord from the castle uh, placed under a curse. And uh, because he eventually did the right thing by, um, by taking off the belt, uh, he, he is spared. He just gets a little nick on his neck and he goes back and becomes a better knight. Just This just cuts to black, but the director did say he did film basically the original ending from from the from the poem and is uh, uh, Gowan does survive and there is a hint of that if, if you stick uh, stick around to the end at, at the very end you see a, a little girl picking up the crown and putting it on her head and you know the, the director said you can kind of picture that as Gowan going back marrying his true lady love becoming a good king of Camelot uh, and having having his daughter succeed him at some point even if Camelot falls right the end um, Woo! Woo! But there's a lot that I left out there. There's a lot of the Christmas. You're like, what does this have to do with Christmas? What does this have to do with the winter solstice? What does this have to do with Gnosticism? What does this have um, to do with anything? There was a lot that you. Uh, there's a lot that you left out, but there's a lot you put in. That was amazing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Especially the gay stuff. I'm yeah. so glad well, that well, that. So yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it it is in the original story because it's. It's kind of hit, you know. She's seducing him in the original story. In the original story, he gives he gives what he doesn't do. He like I think it's three days in the original story, and he gives he gives him a kiss every day, right? Because the lady love gave him a kiss, but he doesn't give him the girdle, right? But it's kind of you know the the story. If you kind of read in between the lines, you kind of get the idea that you know what's the big deal about some kisses? You kind of get the idea that there's a little bit more going on about kisses, and then there's the girdle around the waist where you know it was probably written by a monk, or maybe they're hinting at a little bit more so and a little mm. bit more about why too he doesn't want to give it to the lord um so yeah anyways i've talked a lot somebody, somebody else please oh. anybody else talk <laughs> i'm gonna drink this cocoa by the way well there we go yeah merry christmas uh this will this will probably be like we're recording this on the first of december but it'll probably come out a little a little later than that closer to the uh, to the the actual date of christmas um yeah uh I mean, I, I have a whole lot of feelings about this uh, this movie. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I would actually prefer to have a cinematic universe like the Marvel Universe, only have it be like adaptations of chivalric romances. Um, uh, yeah, like that would be amazing. Um, a A24, uh, are you listening? Because right. we have a pitch for you. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> very lucrative, very lucrative. Yeah. <laughs> uh, apparently uh, it made... 19 million on a budget of 15 million so yeah, that's four that's million bucks yeah. <laughs> there yeah. you go. I, I i wouldn't mind four million bucks that's true yeah yep. um but yeah so like i've got a lot of feelings about it i think like there is some really the uh one of the things i think in general obviously the movie's made today um mm -hmm. and it's being cast in ways that that reflect the fact that it's being made today because it's using characters uh with ethnicities that aren't it's not really worrying about what would be real or or historical or what have you i feel like it's it's just letting choosing good actors for good roles yeah. um because you know you really want realism in this movie if everybody picked up from my description right <laughs> it's exactly. the most important yeah. thing but even yeah. even if it was real blah 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 the ancient world was much more diverse and yeah oh, Anyways, continue, yeah. Jason. why okay. did i say why am i letting you talk and keep interrupting you okay so, so i'm gonna i'm gonna mute myself hold on <laughs> 
<laughs> you have to now press a button before it can say something. Um, the, <laughs> yeah, one layer of defense, you know. One layer. The, uh, <laughs> the, the other thing I wanted to kind of add into this is that I feel like particularly Gawain is one of the more, is a modern character in a medieval period. Um, he's, he's reacting in ways that are like how we would react as we're trying to figure out how to move through this mythical world. So in, in that respect, it almost has like a horror movie vibe where like it's the person who knows they shouldn't go down into the basement or something like that. Um, they're, they're questioning why things are happening the way they are, but then also like, okay, is if this is what the rules are, then maybe this is what I do. Um, but it's that lack of knowing. I think a very modern sensibility is the lack of knowing what I should be doing in any given moment. And that, that whereas everyone else is like, I know my role in this story. I know what I'm doing. Um, so that was just a that was a, th a thing that I, I thought I kind of noticed the whole way through. Um, but yeah, B, what did uh, what, what was your take on it? Yeah, I mean, overall, I thought it was a gorgeous movie. I mm. definitely like even for the cinematography and just the whole style of the movie and the performances. I would say absolutely watch it. Uh, I felt like they probably could have taken about a half an hour out of the movie, if I'm being <laughs> honest. <laughs> um, and I, I just think they're, well, a lot of this movie has no dialogue. I would say that it really mm. surprised me that there was so much of the film that kind of unfolded silently and that there would be these little scenes um, um, kind of thrown into this larger journey. But a lot of the time that we were just kind of journeying with Gawain, it was largely silent or or using, really using like the medium to tell the story. So while I appreciated it, I also uh, thought it could have been edited a little tighter <laughs> in my I, I think there's problems. I, I think there's problems with the third act. Like it, it needs to be tighter. I, I, this is controversial, but I, I, most movies should only be an hour and a half. And this movie, I think if it was an hour and a half, like I want to do my own edit would be, would be the perfect movie. Now there's some exceptions to that. Okay. I'm going to meet myself again. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the, there's an, there's an, an almost nightly sense of, of discipline that John is showing here. Um, the, uh, uh, what was I going to say? The one thing I'll, so this was actually my second time watching it. I saw it when it, when it came out in the theaters. Um, and that was a, it was a stunning, like the, the sound is so rich in this film um, and that when you're in a cinema that really comes across like the rumble of the Green Knight's voice and the, like the, the piercing high notes of the some of the soundtrack. Um, and I think like it did feel long then, but watching it again last night, I was actually really struck by how quickly it seemed to go. And maybe that's simply because mm. I, I knew what was going to happen, but that, but that I think uh, one of the big things about one of the other big things I think about this movie is a sen is its sense of mystery and its sense of leaving space for us to not have an answer. Like we, we talked earlier about that great scene where um, uh, where Essel is asking Gawain, "Can I be your lady?" and he just doesn't answer. And there is a there is a more con or like a, a more commercial version of that scene that takes half as long and does a lot of back and forth shots between them of their mm -hmm. reactions. Um, uh, but that the length of this scene is actually kind of what contributed to just how uncomfortably real it was. And so, uh, like th there's another really great moment where Gawain, after the, um, the, br the brigands steal all of his stuff, he's tied up and, and like, you're kind of like, well, how's he going to get out of this? And then the camera does this spin around a really slow spin. Um, like it, as though the camera were on a tripod turning in a circle and, it goes, it goes past Gawain, and then when it comes back to him again, it's now a, a long dead body with like with just like exposed bone and uh, like it's it's not like he just died. It's that like he's almost imagining a like a, a, a much like much longer death when the camera comes back around again and he's back. And that is such a transition point for me of like where the movie really becomes mythical, mm. where like. Or where Gawain moves into a more mythical space. I mean, he's already met a tree man, but like, <laughs> uh, but if that spin was done faster or wasn't done, I think you might it might uh, lose a little bit of that extra weirdness that then you're then now prepared for. Yeah, you know. Oh, sorry, I'd be. Uh, I was just going to say that that everything you said was brilliant because I, I was thinking similar things. So, okay, go ahead, B. 
<laughs> no, you can go. <laughs> no, I mean, I just, I agree with you. I was thinking a lot of the same thing. But I will say with that spin, that that's sort of, the, you know, in, in the Celtic worldview, they, they talk about the other world. But mysteriously, the other world is this world. And there's, mm. there's a lot of, like, crossing barriers um, and barriers breaking down in these liminal spaces. And, and I found that to be be very Celtic, right? And there's almost a, because, because you see this, is it another corpse? Is it him? There, there's almost a kind of, like, passing through the veil into the into the other world which is mm -hmm. both the world of dreams and the follow Jung, right the world of dreams is also the world of the dead so there's kind of a symbolic death and and for all those esotericists out there again i don't think the direct, director met, met uh, meant this but he, he's attacked by three brigands and then he dies and is resurrected and you know this lines up with with a lot of sort of classical esoteric uh, uh imagery uh, doing with ritual initiation uh um and, and you're right there is there is glimmers right he you know there is a magical tree man but i think you're right jason that's really the point where where he goes to odds right where where he really mm -hmm. crosses that barrier because this world is the other world but suddenly he is fully in that other world right and he's no longer in a liminal space um and it's uh yeah so amazing insights because they're the same insights i had so um a anything that agrees with, with i with what i think is i think very very piercing good insights <laughs> <laughs> b what were you what were your thoughts I was going to say that it, it parallels the ending as well, because spoiler mm -hmm. alert, but uh, John's already said it, that we have this moment of thinking we're seeing the rest of his life playing out. And then uh, all of a sudden his head falls and we're back with him in that moment of of with the Green Knight, which I didn't see coming, to be honest. I, I was like, oh, here we are again. OK, great. Um, which was great because I was very upset with him by the end of the movie. I was like, <laughs> okay, apparently this is a tragedy, like, great. Uh, so, so, but I, I felt like some of those moves really were to um, like unsettle you in time also. Mm -hmm. So you're not really sure when we are, or where we are, or, um, you know, we just like the end when we see him age, but then, was that a flash forward that he's having? Did we actually kind of magically play with time and he was able to live out a life and then go back? So I thought, I, I agree. Those, for me, it, the, actually the two scenes that you talked about, Jason, were not scenes that I would have cut short, that those were effective <laughs> to me. Um, I think it was more some of the journeying with him al alone later mm -hmm. in the movie that I really just kind of wanted him to, get to the next place. <laughs> You're like, uh, okay. I was like, okay, oh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think it's really interesting. I have a lot actually that I want to talk about, but one of the things that I did write down is this uh, this niche like intersection of horror and Christmas. Mm. And my just to talk like modernity, my wife is a huge horror fan and I am just generally not. And so we do a lot of negotiating. Like if we're going to watch a horror movie, <laughs> then we have to like watch something she, she never wants to watch in return. Um, but we do love Christmas movies. And in the last few years, we've had to add like a lot of horror to the repertoire, <laughs> just <laughs> to the horror Christmas repertoire. Um, and there's even some new ones coming out this year with David Harbour from Stranger Things is gonna yeah, yeah. play like an evil Santa Claus or something. <laughs> um, but I think going back to the very beginning when John, you were talking about Christmas being part of the Halloween season or at least mm -hmm. in, for the pagans, like part of the season of death as well. And then if you also think about how the calendar is, is that, that Christians identify with is not even historically accurate to maybe when that would have happened. So like Jesus would have been born more in July. So if we were to flip those, then we'd actually be closer to Easter by the time that we get to Christmas in that wheel of the year, than we would be like keeping it at December. So I do think the resurrection story, like this, this intersection of of horror and violence and within the Green Knight specifically, um, his own resurrection, all kind of, and also Christmas, the story is very witchy, right? Like we have the virgin birth, we have this immaculate conception. Uh, we do have this long journey to Bethlehem. We have these three wise men who are all astrologers and following stars. So the stories are all kind of witchy. And, and so I thought this was a great addition kind of to that canon. 
Yeah. And uh, it, it, there, there's this amazing speech from um, uh, uh, Elisa uh, uh, Vicky Kambaderbu. And mm -hmm. she, oh um, the, uh, like, I hope the, she doesn't listen to this. We're so oh, sorry. She, oh, oh yeah. she does. No, it's her favorite show. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, again, you know, uh, I, I, I've mentioned my wife on the show. So, so Alicia, you, you really have to stop emailing me, right? Like, you know, I, I think you're really nice, but, uh, you really got to leave me alone. Okay. Cause I am taken, but, um, the, <laughs> You know, she, she has this great speech because people will probably notice that green is both a Halloween color and a Christmas color, right? And she has a speech that unites the two things, which is green is the color of, of vegetation, of new life, of spring, of hope, of plants bursting forth, but it's also the color of rot. It's the color uh, that your skin turns when you die. It's the color of Frankenstein's. It's the color of the moss that will grow on your corpse. So th there's this duality with with green and greenery that, that I think is inherent to Christmas because Christmas, oh yeah, okay, Halloween is Christmas and they're both also Easter. All three of them are all the same things because they have to do with, with death and resurrection, right? So like the, the longest night of the year is the 21st and that would be a logical time, particularly if you, if you lived in pre historic times if you lived in the stone age if you lived at any time until central heating in in a in the northern hemisphere it's the longest night of the year people around you are literally dropping dead like you're going to associate this time with death right uh wolves are eating your family but mysteriously right after the longest day of the uh, longest night of the year every day gets a little bit longer the sun has been resurrected it's come back to life. So there's a duality right there in nature that kind of gets people thinking and gets woven into these myths. And, and I think there's sort of an, an over-exaggeration. I'm obviously the defending JC guy, even though we're Gnostic Christians, and we will get to Gnosticism, by the way, but I, I think what we're talking about is Gnosticism. By the way, it's very hard to define Gnosticism, and, and regular sh uh, viewers of the, of the show now know that my new definition of Gnosticism is whatever I say it is. So... <laughs> um, but you know, Jason's not a big JC guy. You know, I, I I'm down with him. Uh, I'm always picking on Jason for that. But um, and, and you it's, know, it's and, so funny. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm I'm more like less of a Roman Catholic Church imperial history guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You you dig Yeshua? That's fair, but that has yeah. nothing to do with Yeshua exactly. at all. Yeah. <laughs> Justice for Yeshua. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, but, Justice for Yeshua. He was just so, a folk magician who was totally killed and then used for profit and exploitation. Precisely, and killed by imperial hope. powers. <laughs> yeah. Which no. is what Jason's not down with, which is fine. Yes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I love Imperial Powers. No, I don't. <laughs> okay. So continuing on. So I, I think there's this, this over-exaggeration about, you know, Christmas being stolen from the pagans. Because if, if you're a Christian at these times, it would seem, even though it's not historically accurate, as B said, it would seem like a logical time to put Christmas, right? This time of hope and this time when the sun is born. You actually have early Christians. I think there's some Christian father that flat out says this, right? It's like, well, you know, Jesus... Jesus is our son. Obviously, his birthday is the day that the son is born. Like we don't, we don't think in this way, but uh, you know, ancient people did. Uh, so it's it's not it's not necessarily inauthentic. Um, oh wait, and I want to come back to another point. Now we can just talk about random things throughout the movie. But you know, oh, I, I really like what Jason said that everybody else is in a, a mythical story. Everybody else is in a dream. Everybody is else is in a medieval uh, uh, chivalric story. And the I'm just going to call him Dev Patel. But a Gowan Dev Patel is, is a modern person acting like how a modern person would in these very mythical mythical um, environments. And what I really liked is King Arthur in this movie because again, there is you know the the Gowan character is not the Gowan character from the original. Uh, he, he's much more fallible. But the King Arthur is 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 my King Arthur. He's he's the mythic, you know, wise, uh, archetypical uh, King Arthur um, who, who who is the one in the stories. Although he is portrayed as physically weak, but but very wise, very knowledgeable, very kind, very fatherly, fatherly. And you know, I was reading the uh, what the director meant by him being weak is that he, he did many, mean to set up a bit of a, a Christian versus pagan, the Christian versus nature, really, dichotomy in the movie, which which is there. Um, but as I said, I, I think I, I think there can be some truth and power to, to, to those ideas, but I find them a little overplayed. Um, 
but I, I think what he what he what what he did, and you know, definitely the author, right? Hey, I can also say what Gnosticism is about, and I can also say whatever authors actually meant. But you know, kind of archetypically, a lot of the times Arthur's is a solar hero associated with the sun and the strength of the sun. We only see Arthur in this movie in, in late November and December around Christmas and the solstice, when the sun is at its weakest, right? So the solar hero is weak. Mm. You know, he's sending out this this uh this this more wintry hero this 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 counterpart hero who by the way when you're kind of looking at these these themes of regeneration and renewal and these sort of pagan kings replacing each other you know in in this at some point uh as intimidated by both ends of the movie right the, the sort of dream ending and then the the little coda with the girl picking up the crown uh Gowan becomes the new arthur right so the, there there are of course more resurrections more solar imagery more archetypical uh, uh, characters uh, 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 being uh, uh, woven into the narrative. So, so I, I quite liked all that. Yeah, yeah, that's so <laughs> interesting. No, I love it. That's so interesting about the mm. idea that Gowan would be more of a winter hero, you know, or a lunar hero, if mm. we're than than a solar hero. And that's really that's really fascinating to me. I did. I was doing some research and uh, and came across something that. So apparently during the medieval period, the body and the soul were believed to be so intimately connected that wounds were considered to be like an outward expression of an internal sin. Mm. And so I thought that was really interesting when you look at the, like the wounding or the violence kind of throughout the movie. And what made me think about it was when you said Arthur was physically weak, because there's that scene right before he leaves where his tooth is hurting, like he has a toothache. He kind of mm -hmm. always has an ailment that's happening. And then at the very, very end when he is knighting um, and then crowning Gowan, he is very close to death or we're supposed to believe that he was very ill. Um, so, and then just this idea of like, um, kind of the Christian notion of an eye for an eye in the, like, you wound me one year and then next year, like, I will return the favor. I just thought that with that, all of these wounds with the medieval notion that somehow that's an expression of, of sin was really interesting to me. I don't, I know, you know, sin yeah. is not a Gnostic concept that's very much Christian, but but yeah, something something in that, and especially with Gowan not being kind of your typical hero, like when he first heads out, these kids are running after him, trying to get his attention or see him off, and he doesn't, he notices them, but he just keeps going, and that struck me as really interesting. Yeah. Um, he has all these moments throughout where he could have made the choice to be kind or generous or even kind of just more uh, in relationship with people, you know, obviously we've already talked about him denying his lover a, a proper position in his life. Uh, and then especially after he goes back in the maybe dream sequence of the rest of his life, you know, seems to be continuing on making all of these choices kind of away mm -hmm. from goodness. And, and he does keep saying that throughout the film, like, I'm not a knight. I don't think I'm meant for greatness. Uh, so yeah, just threads of threads of a winter hero. Mm, mm, that's that's interesting. Like so, this is actually a great segue for me into uh, some of what I've been. One of the things I was thinking a lot about was narrative. Like um, and like I said, he uh, he feels like a very modern character uh, in a in a medieval world. Um, there's sort of the story he's telling himself or trying to tell himself. There's what others are telling him or trying to tell him. Um, there's what he thinks he's doing, what other people think he's doing. Like it's, there's a, a lot of hooks into that for me of like, um, the, like, because well, so uh, um, John was saying that like, it's hard to define Gnosticism quickly. Like one of the things actually I found, I actually asked uh, um, the, that same person, um, uh, John was mentioning Sean, I said like, how could you define Gnosticism without um, without referencing biblical history or like uh, esoteric philosophy. And he described it as as anamnesis, which is I think another word for uh, remembering something you didn't know you forgot. Which Ooh. I was like, damn. Juicy. I know. And this is a guy who has a tendency to 
use a lot of words. So I was very impressed. <laughs> I'm teasing him a little here, but like, yeah, we, we yeah. know he's watching and uh, the folks, <laughs> he, I, he uses almost as many words as I do. So, <laughs> um, but so w where I'm kind of going with this is that for, and I, I think his description fully lines up with what I find, what I find so entrancing about Gnosticism, which is that sense of aha, that like that, that, um, that almost kind of like tickling on the back of your neck that makes you feel like you're close to something bigger than you, you know, um, at least that that's how it experiences for me. And as it pertains to this movie, I feel like we see Gawain have these moments, these glimmerings of possible understandings that then uh, like possible almost remembrances of like what he could be or should be doing and then doesn't. Because I think, B, you really pointed it out well there that like Gawain keeps failing, you know. Mm. Um, what, what One thing I thought was interesting is uh, at the end, when he flinches away from the Green Knight, um, even even when he's just trembling there and the, and the Green Knight's kind of criticizing him for that, I'm like, you know, I mean, like, yeah, he has been failing a lot, but he also did get here and he did eventually, you know, choose to get here. So it's like failing, but going again, you know, I think like that, that to me, there's something very human about that. Like, uh, like uh, sorry, no, not human. There's something more divine about that because it's the ability to fail and still strive yeah. versus only seeing yourself in failure like i'm going to fail so i might as well just not try or i might as well just stop if that makes sense um uh so yeah so that's kind of like the the vague gnosis feeling that i kind of had throughout it um there's also kind of i think that sense of like how much of the gnostic myths that we know have to do with rules with people giving you rules and trying to find your way through those rules um i'm like i'm a little fuzzier on on how this applies but it, it does feel like gawain's kind of both pushing up against these rules and in some cases following them like like is he is he turning away from essel because he doesn't love her or because he thinks he should like he, do you know what i mean like if he, he thinks he's his uh like i can't take you as my wife because you're lowborn etc so like I just, I have to do what I think I have to do. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, or maybe like another way to talk about that. You know, actually I, I've got a, I, I've rambled for a while. B, I want you to, I want you to say something. Uh, and then I've got more thoughts on that. Okay, well, I have tons of thoughts. So we'll ramble great. together. Great, great. Um, great. I wanna pull on the thread of like how I saw Gnosis in the story too, mm. just to add to that. So I loved the, idea that um, there was the whole movie was playing with the idea of seeing versus not seeing and mm -hmm. and and beheading right because like if you're losing your head um, then you aren't seeing anything <laughs> your eyes are on the ground but we also had all of the witchcraft throughout the movie or mm -hmm. and even the mysterious woman in the lord's manner later on all when they were performing rituals they blindfolded themselves with sashes so their magic was all done without the use of their physical eyes um the old woman in the castle the saint that he sees uh, that he goes to her house winifred is her name winifred mm -hmm. um she is beheaded as well and once he retrieves her skull from the well or the the stream she says now i can see you and so i felt like the whole thing was really playing with this idea of seeing and not seeing. And even at the end when Gawain sees his life and then is not happy with it and says, okay, I'm, I'm ready for this now. Um, and I thought it really played with the magic, like the more magical divine aspects of it mm. being something that we can't see with our eyes. We have to experience some other way, you know, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really, again, it does leave a lot of space for mystery. So I don't think the movie prescribes how to experience that, but it's definitely saying it's not with our physical eyes or it's not going to be in the way that you think it is. And so when I think about a Gnostic experience and you, Jason, were saying this, um, maybe this is, is a little bit of a behind the curtain, we email. So in an email, you said um, this kind of Gnostic experience being ineffable. And I was thinking 
that an experience and especially a divine or a, a physical, you know, direct experience with, with the divine, I think it is indescribable. And it's even in us speaking about it, we're trying to wrestle like a magical experience into very limited words, like clunky words. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I, I just, yeah, that's kind of where the gnosis and that, that direct experience was kind of landing for me in the film, was this idea mm. that we, we can't see it, we can't really talk about it. So then it is kind of this silent or internal experience. Uh, that Someone is, keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I love all of that. Well, because there's also like one of the other main ways you can talk about Gnosticism is that Gnosis is something that you cannot learn. Like it's mm. knowledge you don't get by reading a book or doing math or, you know, like um, algebraing your way to, to you know, to Jesus kind of thing. Um, you, uh, it is, it has I, to be. I would have failed that anyway. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, uh, and it's, this is actually a quick side note, but like, it's actually one of the things, even on other Talk Gnosis episodes um, that have been with some other guests where, where I hear them really try to use logic as a way to define how they're, how they're approaching Gnosticism. And although like it's their approach, I don't disagree with. I'm just like, you didn't need to use logic to get there or, or mm -hmm. rather you didn't need to, you didn't need to prove it almost mathematically. You know, you could prove it the same way we do literary analysis in which you defend a position, but you don't necessarily need it to be true in a, in that same kind of like higher level um, because that higher level is indescribable. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's really uh, kind of the the meeting too of like science and spirituality and in, mm. in more modern discourse of saying the the West has put a lot of and the modern West has put a lot of stock in a scientific quantifiable discovery. Right? Okay, mm -hmm. we know this and we can explain this, uh, but that's just boring to me personally, <laughs> but also half of the story, you know, and also even within that, I think to say that we keep discovering things day after day must mean that there are more unexplainable things than there are explainable things. And we are really early in kind of the discovery of that which we can explain. Yeah. So yeah, I just love everything you're saying. That's, you know, it, you, you reminded me of something that's, I think a, like a Buddhist, like one of the, there's like the four agreements or something like, mm, yeah. like, uh, uh, what are they, uh, like illusions are infinite. I vow to uncover them all, something like that. Um, oh, interesting. I don't know about that. The four agreements is a, is also a book, uh, by Don Miguel Ruiz. Oh like, yeah. Don't take things personally. <laughs> Can't do that. But uh, yeah, it's living simply. There's, kind of like... there's some sets of fours by different spiritual teachers. <laughs> and I bet you we can get to at least six of them. Perfect. <laughs> sounds great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I will um, argue for, for for a little bit of straight Gnosticism, which is, uh, and, and I'll send the link to Jason to put in the show notes, uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I, I did do a show uh, that with a guest I'm hoping to have back called uh, The Gnostic Paragon. A, a very fascinating, again, uh, they... A book published by an academic publisher by a PhD, originally a PhD thesis. Not that, you know, scholars have to be right about everything, but uh, I, I just want people to think that I'm smart and not talking out of my butt. But but she she has a very strong argument that there is that there's a lot of direct Gnosticism from the ancient world into the literature of England in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. So she uses the examples of uh, Pierce Plowman, the Pearl poet, and I can't remember the other one. So it's uh, it's kind of foundational in this very early layer of English literature. And of course, Gowan ends. The uh, and the Green Knight is is part of this foundation literature, foundational literature. And for a long time, esotericists have been saying that that there's that there's Gnosticism in the King Arthur stories. So something I find very interesting. Um, I, I guess I have to start with. We often talk about how great Sophia is, but but if you read the Cephian myths about Sophia carefully, she's a much more ambivalent figure, right? And um, in this movie, you know, I mentioned Morgan Le Fay in in the 
in the Arthurian legends, plural, being sort of an ambivalent figure. In this movie, she's kind of an ambivalent figure. You're not quite mm -hmm. sure what's up with her, even though it's his mom, because she seems to be the one who created the Green Knight to set the whole thing in mo motion. If you read it with his ending with, uh, with Gawain's death, then okay, maybe that's not the greatest mom in the world, right? As I said, I, I don't think that that is, that is what happens, but it, it is left ambivalent, but I think he does, you know, he does achieve a kind of gnosis, I, I think is, is mm. you know, the director basically says he survives, right? So he made all these wrong decisions, he finally makes the right ones, he goes back and he becomes a great king, right? I think is what, is what, is what you're, is, is a, a valid interpretation of the movie, but I like that it's ambivalent. So who's, who's the one who sets us all, all in motion? This ambivalent wisdom, magical female figure right who puts him through <laughs> all of these lived trials so that he can gain gnosis you know that that's a sophianic figure um and and often and you know i i'm not being gender essentialist here because uh, uh often I, I think in in gnosticism and in uh the western esoteric tradition it's it's women who initiate and give uh, and the feminine uh, who, who initiate and give wisdom, uh, I think following that so uh, Sophianic pa pattern. And that doesn't, now, now sometimes there's a more sexist interpretation of this, that it's always, it's always women giving knowledge to men, right? But I would argue it's also women always giving w wisdom to women, right? Um, uh, uh, so I, I think that, that that this is kind of present or can be read in or is uh, appearing archetypically out of the out of the narrative due to the fact that there might be a little bit of kernel of Gnosticism hidden in some of these Arthurian uh, uh, legends. You know, I, I'm doing a lot of thinking and, and maybe Jason will, will agree with me um, that, that that there is and maybe you won't. But but there is there's a lot more Gnosticism in in the West than than people like to admit. Now I I used to be and people will be hearing a lot about this on the show shows that I'm on, which is you know I've gone back and forth from Gnosticism is the most important thing in the entire universe and isn't it a weird coincidence that the thing that I'm passionate about is so important? And the it's just <laughs> it's this quirky weird thing that I a quirky weird guy are, is into right. So I kind of swing between those two poles, but lately. Uh, due to some academic work I've been doing, I have swung to the the poll that, that Gnosticism actually is this incredibly important thing that is always the specter, the ghost that is that is haunting the West. And, and you know, B, I actually do see it kind of tightly tied in with witchcraft in many ways, where one of the, some of the traditions that kind of continue ancient Gnosticism are the more magical traditions, mm. right? Because Gnosticism is always, it's, it's always the thing that, that's pushed to the edge. It's always the thing rejected. It's always always the thing repressed. So, you know, who's who's rejected and repressed, right? Witches, magicians, you know, there's this kooky stuff. Now, I'm not saying that all witches are Gnostics, all Gnostics are witches, but but I think there is the, that there is a stream that sort of carries some Gnostic elements throughout the ages in, in these sort of witchier magical uh, traditions. Um, so, uh, man, I think I made my point. I can stop now. Cool. Yeah, no, well, I want to I want to hop on that please, because please. I think that there's something to this idea of um, Gnostics and witches or pagans or, you know, however that people want to identify as it is a direct experience with yeah. source energy or creative energy in a way that uh, people are using it for some sort of personal gain, whether that is, and I think there's a negative connotation to that, but there actually might not have to be because there are all of these other um texts and and in religion but like spiritual principles that really even speak to more of a christian god saying we are supposed to be having a good life here you know these these things are supposed to be making our lives easier or or better or more enjoyable or or whatever we're not here to suffer and so that does kind of go in direct opposition with more of a traditional Christian and or Roman Catholic kind of structure. So it is these people who have the audacity to say, I alone can have this experience and can work with these forces and can be a part of, of divinity. And in fact, I am divine myself that I think a more evangelical Christian church would absolutely want to oppress that because they need to be the gatekeeper between people and divinity. And without it, what their whole existence would be called into question. So 
I will, I'll back this theory, this armchair expert theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, this is a topic for another time, but I, I think uh, regular listeners and watchers of the show, which by the way, you know, we have about 3,000, which is a, a good reminder that we only have about 44 patrons. So patreon.com slash Gnostic <laughs> for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, we can, uh, we can do, we can do more. Also, you know, we do pay ourselves a very small amount, but I've spent most of my adult life mired in poverty. And I, I do like eating so uh, we do use the money to pay for the shows but it, it buys me groceries if you don't have any money please do not give us any if you have if you're more poor than me and i know there are people who are more poor than me that have given us money and i want to give it back but i thank you so much for it you can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash gnostic yeah oh my gosh wow <laughs> wow i don't even know what to make of that i was gonna make a joke and then i was like i don't think i have one <laughs> <laughs> uh, the archons, uh, the archons kicked me out there. That's what I was. Gonna, I was, yeah. I was like, oh man. Speaking man. of personal gain, I don't I think know. this is blessed anymore. No. <laughs> paypalme gnostic for one-time donation. <laughs> uh, we understand if you can't give us money because uh, because because we're all we're all there. And really, don't give us money if you can't. But you can help us out by telling people about the show, sharing the show, putting it on the social media. Again, talk about the archons game. Uh, we've made a lot of comparisons between uh, AI, uh, computer algorithms, and uh, Gnostic ideas about Archons. I think they're all very similar ideas. And th th the show does better. The algorithm lifts us up if you do share it, if you like and subscribe, if you leave good reviews, high ratings, and nice comments. But of course, if you do have any complaints about anything that uh, we say, you simply email Jason at GnosticWisdom.net with any complaints. Um, uh, the, uh, and maybe one other little coda to that, too, would be that... Uh, if there's a particular thing you want us to do in a popnosis fashion, I mean, becoming a patron a patron on Patreon would be a great way to start that. And oh yeah, send us yeah. a message and like essentially like commission a show. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. If you give us money, we'll do whatever we you, we you tell us to do. <laughs> <laughs> to talk to us, to talk to us, popnosis right. guarantee. This, no, this is a slippery slope. <laughs> <laughs> um, do um, you have time for like one more? topic so. or metaphor yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we're only okay. at 55 minutes Let's, i mean sometimes we go for two hours but less less you know people people probably want to get back to their christmas shopping but whatever be so on leash i'll make it i will make it very short and succinct yeah. but i know we've talked a lot about uh arthurian legends and specifically the green knight being this combination of christianity and paganism and magic um, I think if you really want to strip kind of all of it away and just look at man versus nature, I mm. think that this is a really interesting, and I mean, man in a, yeah. sorry, gen, a general, human. gender human way, versus a nature. human versus nature, yes. Yeah. Um, I think that it is really about um, human need for order and control, yeah. and especially his position as a knight, you know, having yeah to have this code of chivalry or this conduct, so to speak. And actually a lot of his feelings along the way are ways in which he acts a little bit more human and not like a knight. And then people are like, oh, you did that wrong. You know, that that's not what a knight would do. So obviously it's not, you're not a knight. But I think this, uh, this need for kind of more order or control against nature's chaos you know and the, the magical elements of nature including divinity that we will never be able to control no matter how hard we try uh and the whole thing actually made me think of hildegard uh von bingen yeah. just who quoted uh, <laughs> you're laughing i'm like is is hildy it's not good. appropriate on the show yeah. okay well no, i rules, no. i love her she rules also very problematic, but we can yeah, get into that later. She, she yeah, is yeah, actually yeah. A, saint, a saint in our church, and uh, I can link up. There is a talk where they talk about the problematic aspects of her at the very end of said talk, but she rules. Continue, please. She does. you got to hold yeah. the hole, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but she actually coined a term, uh, veriditas, or greenness, that really mm. does speak to the more divine aspects of nature. And at the time, that was radical in the church because the church structure had also kind of pushed away from nature and said, we can provide order and control. So I know I said, do away with Christians, and I brought Christians back in. But <laughs> um, I do think there's something really cool about this story and kind of human versus 
nature and and how much we actually can work within that. Yeah, you know, actually, in in my notes, oh, I'm sorry, Jason, but uh, I'm not sorry enough to stop talking. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> I I actually have in my notes. I didn't say say human versus nature, but I did. I did just put in a note about about control. I, I think it's even if you're not using sort of the nature, which I I think your formulation of it is amazing. But but I think too, just a, a general spiritual lesson is that we are not in control. And you know, that's what I you know when I studied Buddhism or studied with Buddhists, you know, that was a big point, right? And uh, I, I'm a Libra. And apparently that means I really like to control my environment and I get very upset or I used to get very upset. You know, I'd always want to have the perfect party, the perfect church service, the perfect meditation. I'd plan it all out in my mind. And of course something would go wrong because I, you know, I may be divine, but I'm not the God of this world. So things are never going to be quite the way that you want them to be. And, and I think giving up control without giving up your power. Uh, giving up no. control about giving up your power is is uh, or or giving up your your need to control others, your need to control the situation, your need to control the world, which is very demiurgic, is is an important uh, lesson on the spiritual path. Now, it's an important lesson on the spiritual path, folks, that I have still not completely learned. So don't you know? I think that it is an important lesson. I think it's something to to practice. But uh, I'm I'm not there yet. Please, Jason. Well, no, and I think like. Uh, it, this has been touching on really well, like about um, a lot of the things that he's doing where people are like, that's not, that you, that's not very nightly for you to be doing that. Oh, sorry, my cat is attacking a box. Mucho. Um, one second. See, this this is actually what gets us hits because, well, you can't see the cat on it. And some people listen to it as a podcast, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, can we, we get a, a verbal description of the cat for those yeah. listening on audio right now? Yeah. Uh, he's a, a mackerel tabby. Um, uh, he's got a snaggle tooth. When one of his teeth was knocked out uh, in a fight when he was uh, with his brother, oh. and so now his other tooth pokes up his lip in a very cute way. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, let's, let's get that guy on our new TikTok because we'll <laughs> we don't have a TikTok yet. <laughs> when we do, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so uh, oh, here he is on my lap now. Oh. Um, the the uh, the thing about him, about Gawain not doing nightly things like that you know you are no knight or no knight would ask me that question, I think is interesting because most of the time when he when somebody is saying that to him it's because he's he's essentially made a, a selfish choice, mm. which might argue arguably be a more human choice. It's like human in the in the like uh, coldly rational um, like self interested way you know. Um, uh, and that uh, the, and that it, perhaps even his mother with, casting the spell to cause this whole thing to start, is trying to get him into a path where he can make different choices, where he's being confronted with different different choices and better choices. That's kind of the ending. Is him, is him uh, getting having the ultimate moment of choosing between selfishness and uh, and a higher ideal, mm. and then and then like. Uh, fully thinking through what that selfish choice could mean and deciding to go with that higher ideal. Um, uh, the, yeah, so there's something there about like facing facing these like uh, pivotal moments and trying to decide whether or not you're going to try to profit from it or if you're going to try to embrace it or move through it. Like how this notion of, like I know we were talking about sin um, uh, and again, uh, one thing that uh, Sean will often mention uh, uh, on this in chats with me is uh, that sin is the the word for sin comes from archery, and it has to do with missing. Mm. So it's not about committing a, a failure. It's not about it's not about committing a negative act. It's about doing something that's taking you further away from your goal. Mm. Um, yeah. Oh, that's so, interesting. Well illustrated by this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. His moments of shame, his moments of temptation. Are those things that get in the way of, or or make more difficult his path, you know? Um, uh, so I think that's there's something for me really interesting there about uh, about like uh, sort of throwing yourself into the challenge without trying to benefit from it. I think is something that's yeah. interesting. Think, again, how the mother like Morgan Le Fay in a lot of the Arthurian fiction is a villain, like is trying to tear King Arthur down, and in this. Uh, she's not necessarily completely benevolent, but it does feel like she's trying to give her son the chance to be more than than human, if that makes yeah. sense. 
Totally. I've been, I've been reading a lot of Freud lately, and uh, the uh, there's a quote from the director that says, the complicated relationship between Morgan Le Fay and Gowan, written for the film, invokes the director's experiences with his mother and needing to be pushed to stand on his own as an adult. And there is actually, <laughs> there's actually recurring themes of, of mother and children, right? There's this shield, which is broken, you know, there, there's him and, and Yesel and their, their child, you know, the child at the very end. I think there's some more mother and children symbolism throughout it. So, uh, yeah, so, so, so get on the couch and think about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I said, I you know I want to give up control. Uh, this is actually Jason and B's show, but but should we start wrapping up? Uh, yes. what, do you, what do you folks say? Hey, Jason, Jason, a quick question: Have you written and released any books lately? Uh, do you know anybody who has? Is there anyone? <laughs> uh, I haven't, but I think someone oh, else has. What? Who? Uh, hey, a great Christmas or Yule uh, present. <laughs> yes, for anyone witchy in your life. Well, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, this is so sweet. Thank you. Um, that's me. My real name's Rebecca. Uh, <laughs> I did. I wrote a book called The Witch's Book of Numbers. And if I had to go back, oh, Hildy's in it. Hildy's in the book. But if I did have to go back and do it again, I would probably write a lot, a lot more about knights because we didn't talk about numbers really in, in this legend or in this movie, but it was definitely kind of prevalent oh, all around yeah, lots, lots of fives yeah. lots of others yeah tons of fives yes yeah, some yeah. other ones uh but i have written a book it's on numerology and witchcraft and kind of the intersection of of those topics and much much more and i my hope with it is that there's something in it for everyone and yeah it's available online wherever books are sold you can go to the dreaded amazon and if you do please write and leave a review um unless you hated it and then you can email jason <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yes it's out and i'm very happy with it and i hope that yeah it would make a great gift this holiday season thank you you know uh just when you mentioned the witch's book of numbers there is a feeling like uh th there's almost a whole nother topic maybe a whole nother episode to talk just about the witchcraft elements of the of the story like yeah just how the mother was portrayed and like yeah you know, like the, there's a, sort of a maiden mother crone thing happening. Like, yeah, there is. Uh, totally. Okay. Yeah, um, especially with the um, the Saint, Saint Winifred and the older yeah. woman in the castle. There's definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, all a, of those. there's a young girl that's uh, singing to Essel in the in the vision of, of his future. And there's like, I think she's even in the same ritual when Morgan Le Fay is uh, is summoning the green knight in the first place oh interesting yeah there were four women around around yeah. that whole space yeah and like she summons the green knight with a with a weird letter i want to read that letter yeah me too <laughs> yeah. i thought that was really interesting so yeah but i didn't i'm not again you know i i didn't have enough time to think of a theory of what that means I know. So, <laughs> yeah no it was cool, though the depictions of all yeah. the magic and all the mm -hmm. ritual magic in the film were really awesome yeah um uh, a couple of like last Gnostic notes here, maybe that I think struck me uh, that maybe are worth kind of thinking about is that because it's a Celtic or it has a Celtic story element to it, there's also like the idea of the fairy circle in which time slips and time changes. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. And I think it's a way in which like a, a lot of Gnostic ideas can come through. Uh, John was mentioning that like the other world of, of, not, of um, Celtic myth is often just our world, but like to the side or in the shadows or something. And I think like that's kind of where Gnosis lives is Gnosis is living around us entirely, but we sometimes need a fairy circle to kind of find it or slip inside it. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is we, we haven't touched on it much, but Arthur says near the beginning, it's only a game. I wanted to bring that back up. Yeah. <laughs> um, which yeah, like again, has a very Gnostic sense of like, questioning the the story that you're being given or the rules you're, you're being told to follow um, by remembering that it's a structure there for you, but it is not the whole picture, you know, mm. um, was just something that really struck me. And I, that was just in this conversation when you said it's only a game. I'm like, that's what that, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah. yeah that's... I also saw that as like a call to remember to bring levity into mm. your spiritual pursuits or into your striving. We've used that word already because mm. I think that um, that's something that Gowan does not have. He seems to be a very serious person yeah. throughout. Um, and it 
it's those moments where if he could inject some kind of levity into it, that he actually might be available for a different choice instead of oh. continuing to make the same choice. Well, yeah, and, thinking about it being a game and keeping it light. And what's and so it, interesting, like at the end when when he when he rejects the vision and the asks for his head to be cut off, the Green Knight just puts puts his finger on on Gawain's throat and smiles at him. And says, yeah. off with your head. Okay, yeah. off with your yeah. head. You know, like, yeah, yeah it does seem it's to be like, a very cheeky moment. Oh, yeah, folks, like, for, for, for some of that lightness, sorry to interrupt, but I think you will like this. But apparently the director told the Green Knight actor to play it as if he was Santa Claus. So it ties in with that playfulness, with that fun, Christmas, but also the Christmas. Yeah. yeah. And the oh, violence. Yeah. Just kidding. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, just like off with your head and then the smile is kind of has that sense of like, it's that the 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 um the serious comedy like if that makes sense the yeah it, like you you had to go through hell to get here but now you can now now you can move on now you can actually live because you've you know you've you you've pushed through all of these challenges like yeah, yeah. um anyway i'm uh, i'm trying to wrap up here the the one other I know. thing too, i'm like don't say that santa claus is also another figure of judgment you are nice <laughs> or naughty <laughs> <laughs> Valissa Caterpillar is very like playful, right? And so many of the other characters are very playful, but he's always, you know, kind of kind yeah. of dour even. Yeah, he doesn't smile much. Um, uh, so in, in, the, in the interest of wrapping it up here too, I did want to mention that that Buddhist thing I mentioned is the four great bodhisattva vows, not the four agreements. Mm. Okay, great. <laughs> and it's the, uh, the one that I was thinking of um, Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them all. Mm. Um, so I think that just, again, was connecting to that idea of like throwing yourself at a challenge that seems impossible. Um, but that is like the, the striving is worth the, is the, is the point, not the, not the victory. Yeah. Well, and that goes to, to both of your points about Gnosticism being equally about not knowing as mm. it is about knowing is that, at the end of the day, we won't know the answer to any of these questions. You know, we can only kind of play with the riddle of them. We won't have a definitive understanding of much, I don't think, uh, mm -hmm. at this point. We like we catch it in glimpses or like we were talking about with Gawain in dreams or time slips. Uh, but that at the end of the day, we probably will be left with, well, I don't know. And I think there is actual levity in there uh, mm -hmm. as well of saying, I can devote an entire life to playing with the mysteries, but I might not actually get anywhere and that can be okay too. Totally, totally. Mm. Well, talking about uh, King Arthur, holygrail.substack.com is my parish in Montreal. If you're ever in the Montreal area, <laughs> go there for the schedule. And we might, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 I'm, I'm having a baby. Well, I'm not. I already already did the easy part. My, my wife and I are having a baby. So uh, the schedule is going to be a bit erratic. We may do stuff online, depending on where we we're at at the pandemic, because I uh, don't want the baby to die. Uh, and uh, you, can, uh, you can go to jasonmemel.com for all things Jason. And check out sagetheater.com. Uh, uh, which is uh, the theater company that uh, uh, Jason is art your artistic director, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very <laughs> cool. Uh, J Jason, it, actually, it's your show. So do you want do you want to end it? Or actually, it's your show. Yeah. To be, I'm the guest. What am I doing? Libra. <laughs> no, you've been great. We wouldn't have shown a single website or told anybody about where to find us. So exactly. thank goodness you're here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think maybe I'll just uh, I'll just uh, sign off with by saying I've been this has been a super fun conversation. I think. Again, having what I hope the audience might have heard is all of us actually having ideas with each other in the process of conversation, which is to me part of the excitement of, of, of uh, the, the pursuit of Gnosticism is the is that is that uh, engagement and grappling that leads to leads to to more and deeper interesting thoughts. Um, if there's anything that you would be interested in us covering, put it in the comments, send us an email, um, you know, find us on various places online. Um, we've got a bunch of ideas. Uh, we're thinking maybe a Sandman episode. Uh, maybe I'm teasing it a little too early, but um, uh, but yeah, I would we'd be happy to almost engage with uh, all their all different kinds of texts and movies and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Farewell, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy Yule. Happy whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate at this time of the year. Happy Green Night. Happy Green Night. <laughs> happy Green Night. All right.